Hey everybody, I'm Chris Howard. Welcome to Top of Mind. I'm going to do something uh, over the next few episodes just to mix things up a little bit and invite some other Top of Minders to join me. And so today I have one of my other chiefs of research, Soya Borat, who comes from a very technical side of Gartner's business, which is really useful for what we're going to talk about. Uh, you've heard me say in these episodes in the past around we're pursuing a research effort around the future of computing. Uh, and this is a really important part of the work that we're having, and it relates to the AI conversation in this way, in that AI has forced innovation to move faster in, in a lot of areas, and especially in the compute space. And so it was actually last September, so September of 20, uh, 2023, we were sitting together in my New York office and saying, what are the themes that we should be pursuing for 2024? And this was one of them, the future of compute, future of computing. And then, of course, I went directly to, to Soyev and said, will you run this for me? So that, that's how we got here. And this is why Soyev is joining me today. Uh, but Soyev, that, that's the setup. I want to tell us a little bit about why this project, why now, why it's important. And just tell us a little bit about the scope of it. Yes, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and be part of the Top of Mind series. And uh, as you very rightly pointed out, when we were looking at the evolution with AI, a few things that were coming up significantly in our conversations with our clients was around what is the sustainable computing paradigms that we've been quote as for? We looked at a number of things which you explored even in one of your uh, previous uh, episodes on the uh, on the hype cycle for AI. The future of compute uh, then started kind of taking shape to help answer certain questions around what would that future of computing look like for organizations being able to actually prepare and adopt new computing paradigms to even explore beyond running these particular LLMs or exploring composite as well as generative AI in the future. So we were looking at emerging technologies, how would that drive the need for future compute paradigms, but in a way also assist them. And then what kind of an impact it would have on the underlying architectures, the systems that we have uh, designed today, or will need to go through an entire redesign of current applications. And in some cases, maybe even business work processes or workflows as well. Yeah. So when we started this, we were exploring it more from a technology-centric perspective. But as it emerged, it evolved into saying, is this the responsibility of only the INO function or tech service providers? Or will this require collaboration across multiple disciplines within not just individual organizations, but go beyond where certain organizations who are just finding themselves as consumers of these particular compute paradigms to actually partner with tech service providers to be able to define what that future of compute would look like. And that was one of my uh, concerns initially, actually, which was, um, how do we keep this from just being a super nerdy tech topic? I mean, it is, let's be honest. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> complex topic. There's lots of you know deep conversation. But you remember the charge I gave you at the beginning, too, is how do I take this into, say, the CEO's office at JP Morgan and have it be interesting? to him. <laughs> and so that business aspect of what we're doing is really essential here uh, because compute on its own is interesting, but compute applied in a business situation is what makes it valuable. And so we're, we've talked about, you know, what are the horizons of, of, upon which this compute roadmap you know, extends? And we've gone out quite far, right? So maybe just give us the, the quick horizon one, two, three, and then we'll talk about horizon two in some more detail. Okay. Uh, and this is where we took the approach of actually uh, extending it or breaking it down into various horizons and looking at what does the future look like two to five years from now, which is what we try to capture as part of Horizon 1, and then five to 10 years, and then even beyond. Because what it did was it helped us actually classify the various compute paradigms that we were kind of tracking in terms of the evolution and what were some of those particular combinatorial effects that could actually help us adopt future paradigms in the future. But as much as we talk about the technology, it was the emerging use cases that were being explored by organizations and businesses that were driving some of those particular needs of those particular future paradigms. Because it's more not dependent that uh, uh, companies are not exploring any use cases on quantum just because quantum is not commercially available across. Uh, or more uh, available as uh, LLMs, uh, depending on GPUs. It's more around the part that what future use cases we could explore, where it would play a very important role to be able to bring in um, uh, or explore even quantum and integrate it within existing compute architectures and support business processes that are underlying 
uh, within those uh, within those technology architectures. Yeah. One of the questions I get asked a lot, in fact, I was with our oncoming class of interns down in Dallas uh, a few weeks ago, and they asked, one of the questions they asked me is, well, how do you think about the future? Like, how do you actually like, you know, project what's going to happen? And like so many things, you know, the, 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 the elements of the future exist in some form today. You just talked about them existing as potential use cases. So like, what's a problem hard enough for quantum to be applied to? Like, that's an indicator for today. Right. But there may be theoretical math or there may be advances in silicon that aren't at scale yet but are actually happening. Things like neuromorphic technologies, right, are very nascent, but it's not like they don't exist. And so when we project out in the future, even you know beyond 15 years, we're looking at indicators now that actually point us in that direction to say that is likely. There's some probability that that's going to happen, which takes us out to Horizon 3. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. So right, let's talk a little bit about the horizons, transitions from one horizon to another, and then we're going to zoom in on horizon two. So one of the things that you and the team have put together is there's actually convergences that happen that lead us into the next horizon. So things become mature enough or there's some external thing that happens. Uh, and so, for example, um, if you look at the history of machine learning, there was theory that existed prior to compute capability. And once we ended up with the ability to do massive parallel computing, it made, made it much easier to do machine learning and then eventually generative AI, which takes a lot of power and things like that. So you could see that that's maybe uh, a change that happens that allows the next horizon to start to evolve or S-curve or whatever, whatever uh, metaphor you want to use. Talk to us a little bit between horizon one to two to three. What do those changes look like? So uh, as we bucketed some of those particular use cases that were being explored, uh, by organizations and we kind of bucketed them in terms of the feasibility uh, with the technology being able to support it. We were looking at uh, some of the use cases from multilingual avatars to smart robotics to wearable AI accessories and even looking at polyfunctional uh, robots to diagnosis of thought or nanosensing. Hang on a second. Diagnosis of thought, let me stop you there. What do you mean? <laughs> what is that? Oh. <laughs> so diagnosis of thought where... Um, in most cases, psychologists look at um, um, lingual patterns and other patterns to be able to do some diagnosis, especially in case of schizophrenia. Now, as part of that particular process, how would you bring in compute paradigms or leverage some of the neuromorphic technologies to be able to sense audio, understand behavioral patterns, look at visuals or body language, and then identify what kind of thoughts would be going through the minds of the individual? Mm. That's where the diagnosis of thought kind of like comes in. And in order to be able to support it, you are looking at compute paradigms like neuromorphic or even tickle uh, uh, or quantum to be able to even do those particular simulations to begin with, and then build language models that will be able to support the kind of prompts that would take cues not just on text, but on audio frequencies, as well as even visual representations or body language as well. Yeah, it's interesting. And it relies on the Neuralink technologies to actually create the interface, which is something that exists today. And so that's that's what I mean about there's there are, there are aspects of this that exist before the thing that we're talking about, like the diagnosis of thought. That's potentially, you know, fairly controversial, don't you think? Just from a societal point of view, is there an ethical dimension to the future of compute that the team's exploring? The biggest implementation use cases that we've seen so far has been more around patient diagnosis. And I think this has actually helped us understand some of these particular diseases better. Um, Alzheimer's being a, a, a major kind of like a black box in terms of trying to be able to understand what are some of those particular reasons for dementia or Alzheimer's. So this gives us an opportunity to be able to even understand some of those particular neurological aspects of it and be able to better uh, provide those particular kind of diagnosis to the specialist as part of being able to use it. Yes, there is an aspect of uh, uh, you know manipulation of thought on one side, but the diagnosis has far more uh, bigger impact and benefits from yeah, that, a medical standpoint. This balance, you know, between the therapeutic use and the potential unintended consequences is something that we're going to have to tackle more and more as the power of AI gets miniaturized and you know put in the body, create a body area network, any all of those kinds of things. Okay, so that, that seems like a little further away. Let's go to Horizon 2 and tell us about Horizon 2 because it may be something that people are feeling is coming to them already. Sure. So 
in horizon two, I know we've all as an industry been waiting for when is quantum going to be available and when will we be able to use quantum and your morphic. But one of the things that we are realizing is that it's not going to be a switch where we will just switch from one particular compute paradigm to another. We talk about it in the context of uh, the supercomputers that we have uh, even right now that kind of combine classical computing paradigms and we have been innovating it as part of topologies and architectures to be able to create much more efficient architectures to be able to process far more amount of data points than we used to be able to do in the uh, 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 in the past with the parallel computing. But when quantum and neuromorphic really become available, it's not that we are going to be able to transition from classical compute paradigms and just go over and switch everything to quantum or neuromorphic. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a combination, which means that our future architectures are going to be much more hybrid. And the emphasis and the focus is going to shift in terms of how do you orchestrate a particular business process and design a system that can actually leverage the strengths and the potential each of the individual compute paradigms offer to be able to support the use cases, kind of like the diagnosis of thought or the polyfunctional robots or nanosensing that we are kind of envisioning when we get to five, five to 10 years from now. Yeah, the other thing that you and I have talked about as well, and I've mentioned sometimes on, on top of mind, is that the, the, the increasing innovation and power and mass within the parallel computing environment, I wonder sometimes, does that pull quantum closer to us? Does it make it push it further away? Does it make it less necessary in effect? Because the power of the classical computing along with parallel computing with the you know, capabilities of the math and the models actually takes us into the quantum problem space without actually having to jump to a qubit machine to do it. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Where do you think that goes? I think the more we are, ex that's a very uh, interesting way of putting it. And uh, I think it's getting us closer to be able to adopt the future compute paradigms, like especially quantum, and be able to see as to how we could integrate these particular systems. Because the first step usually is that we don't just switch from one compute paradigm to another, but we first look at ways in terms of how we can integrate, how we could go about actually combining and uh, identifying those individual components where we could leverage simulation processes, as well as being able to uh, leverage uh, some of the advantages that quantum would provide, and then integrate it within our business workflows that are much more dependent on classical compute paradigms, and be able to start deliver those particular benefits to the end users, given the current frame of the technology, as well as the architecture that we live in right now. At our IT symposium events around the world this fall, we're going to be taking this topic and digging in even more deeply. So there's a signature series session, which is a standalone breakout session at the event where we're going to be telling this whole story about the future of computes in more detail. So watch out for that. You'll see the dates around the world here. Find a place that suits you and come pay us a visit. So right, let's talk about the far future. And what I'm thinking here is if I am a, an enterprise, am I just a consumer? of this you know, emerging compute or, or do I shape it? And what's my role actually in this if I'm the consumer of the technology? Um, this is one of the questions that we've kind of like battled uh, through as well, that uh, is this uh, the conversation that we should be having only with tech service providers and uh, uh, the, uh, the organizations that are delivering these particular technologies and what happens to the insurance organizations or the logistics organizations and how can they be uh, participate in terms of shaping it? Mm -hmm. If you truly look at it, the future of computing is much more value laden mm -hmm. There's business value and there's that particular competitive edge that it presents because of the endless possibilities with the kind of use cases and the opportunity to be able to leverage a combination of compute mechanisms based on their individual strengths. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the question that we should be asking ourselves, irrespective of what particular industry we are coming from is, do we want to be just standing there as kind of bystanders or really be part of building what that particular future architecture, business, as well as technology architecture should look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, undoubtedly, it's inherently going to be complex from what we are seeing already because of the various compute paradigms. Mm -hmm. But why not participate in terms of shaping that particular technology rather than the technology shaping us? Right. And by shape, you know, how I talk to, to my clients about this is 
shaping by pushing, right? So it's, it, the, the worst scenario would be to take all this new powerful compute paradigm and apply it to the stuff that you've done for 20 years. Like that, that's not an advantage. It's really, there are hard problems you've never been able to solve before because you haven't had the capabilities to do it. And now you have the opportunity to shape that, to solve some of the most interesting, most valuable problems for public sector, for citizens, for patients and hospitals, for you know, consumer, what name, name your value receiver. And so I want you to push. I mean, I want you, the listeners, to push, to say, we need this because, okay? So that's one aspect. The other is, well, what if? So some of the projections into the future are like, what if this happens? How would you point yourself towards this? Give us a couple of things to think about what if. So those particular what if scenarios are uh, more along the lines of um, the use cases that we are looking at. How would we go about building uh, the ability to actually build autonomous businesses? Mm. Being able to do manufacturing in space, mm. offloading human memory, uh, implanting chips. So we're looking at kind of worldviews where technology is going to be an integral part, not just as a driver, but even part of our cognitive behaviors as well. Mm. So rather than just being interested in looking at compute paradigms and then being more as a bystander, mm -hmm. let's why not participate and then shape that particular future? Because... That's what is going to be our future. We are just not a consumer market. We can actually help shape what that particular future looks like and be part of it. Too, too much of the time, technology happens to us. Uh, we certainly have experienced that in recent years, even with social media. This is an opportunity to really shape that future. And it might end up where we're projecting. It might be slightly different, likely to be slightly different. But it's participatory, which is what I love about this topic. So interesting from a tech point of view, fascinating from a business point of view, but also really important for all of the companies that we serve. So thank you so much. I appreciate you joining me today. And this has been Top of Mind, and we'll see everybody next time.